Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. Jacqueline Kaysen was someone I met years ago. I actually saw Jacqueline coach for the first time, Derek, um, at Strong New York, Kenny Santucci's event. And I was, I mean, I just, how do you not fall in love with the girl? I mean, she's amazing. I mean, you know, she came to my house, my whole wife, met, met my family. And, um, but her, her, her training, her energy is phenomenal. She's really, I think, done an incredible job in rolling off and developing her business. She's been helping Mark Maniac. She's been one of Mark's, you know, lead people in there for a long time and helping Mark with his expansion. So putting aside the fact, I think Jacqueline is amazing. And I think she's um, she's an incredible coach and an even better human being, and that's saying a lot. Uh, but you know, Jacqueline, why don't you explain to us right now what did you go through this last January? What was that all about? And um, if we could start the conversation off there. I think uh, people are going to be really um, uh, surprised and, and a little bit of shock. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so my goal is to originally climbed the seven summits, which is the highest peak of every continent in the world. And I already climbed Kilimanjaro in Africa. And then in this past January, I climbed Aconcagua, which is hard to say. And it's in Argentina. It's the highest peak in the Southern hemisphere of the whole world. And it's uh, in South America. It's in Argentina. It's almost uh, 23,000 feet. So it is very, very high. And uh, yeah, a lot's happened you know, while I was there a lot. It's a long, long journey. I was supposed to be there for 10 days, ended up being there for a month, stayed through two groups. And I was very fortunate enough to climb with Nimza, who's the number one climber in the world. They did a movie on him called 14 Peaks. And it's the number one viewed documentary on Netflix. And um, I was very fortunate enough to go with him, but really learn from him. And he guided me the, the whole way, which was amazing. Well, let's, uh, I want to back up for a second. Where did this, this is not a hobby. This has got to become a passion. <laughs> it's obviously yeah. incredibly dangerous. I think a lot of people out, out there wouldn't necessarily understand why would you want to risk your life like this to, to go through an experience like that? What, where did this come from? Yeah, so I started um, many years ago uh, training a, a, one of my clients and they wanted to achieve some sort of mountain. They were going through something in their life. Mountain started off as an analogy. And then they said, no, I really want to actually climb something. And they said, you know what, we should go to Peru. We should climb to Machu Picchu. I said, that sounds amazing. And I climbed them for this trip. And she said, you know, I really could never go on this excursion without you. And I was very humbled and honored. And I said, that sounds great, but I could never go with, with a client like this financially and all these things. And they say, you know what? No, you're, I, I got it. You, you just got to come with me. And it was an incredible experience from there. It just seemed like something that was so impossible and it was such an amazing experience. And it said, wow, we can really do more. We can do more. Where do you want to go to next? And I said, I didn't know there was going to even be a next. Um, I've always wanted to do Kilimanjaro. Let's go there. And that was really challenging. It's almost 20,000 feet. And you'll ask people, like some people say, oh, it's Kilimanjaro, it's easy, it's a walking mountain. But when weather comes into play and things happen along the journey, for some, it's extremely easy. For some, when you hit the, the bad weather, it's not so much. And after that trip, they said, okay, like we're, we're good. That was an amazing time. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm now addicted to this. I must keep going. And at that point, I realized it's only going to get more challenging at, at this point. Like now we're heading down some danger zones. And I really didn't want to go with anyone I knew selfishly because I know I'll worry so much about them, but I could really risk and not pay attention to myself. So I ended up reaching out to NIMS. And I think my why when it first started is so different than my reason and purpose now, because as you keep going, you realize how much the human body is really capable of. We've set so many limitations in our head, physically, emotionally, mentally, that we can't do these things. And something that seems so unattainable or so unachievable 
really is, but you have to be in that space. So when things come up like negative 45 degree weather, things happen with your teammates, um, hypothermia, edema in your face that you just, your purpose and your why is so strong that you just keep going. And when you feel like quitting and giving up and these things happen, it's, you can. And we talk about this with clients all the time. You can't, you know, you can, you can, the body's capable. When you realize like you're touching your limit, which is death, like that's the limit. You realize how much more you can really push that envelope and that barrier. Yeah. Well, it sounds amazing. Um, and I'm, probably not equipped to do what you do just even mentally because I'm I just think about it I'm a warrior right so not a warrior I'm a warrior but uh but in exercise we always think about progressions and uh, I wrote an article recently about Achilles tendon ruptures in sport and I think a lot of the problem is people are just jumping into things too quickly without the preparation so how do you do this like is there a progression like say you want to go to Everest and and I saw that recently there was a, a doctor from from Vancouver area, I think went there and died at base camp because for whatever reason, right? Maybe it was a pre-existing issue. But how do you know that you're going to be ready to go up to those heights and deal with that little oxygen and all the other factors that you're dealing with without making that jump too quickly and and you know not knowing if you can handle it? Yeah. The thing is, is that you can train as best that you possibly can. I live in Miami. I'm below sea level. I'm the worst place to do something like this in the whole world. Um, so the answer is you don't, there's risk. Um, but as I tell everyone else, nothing worth having is easy and nothing changes without taking some risk, but you wanna make sure you have a parachute. So I went with the best guy in the whole world. That was my parachute. Um, unfortunately, there was an incident with a teammate, which I think we'll get into that something very tragic did happen and you don't think of certain things or you can't plan for certain things to happen. You just do and prepare the best that you can, but there is risk involved. And in regards to training, um, a lot of people I know do go to Everest Base Camp and they don't have any preparation of doing these things. And I would not recommend that. The height of Everest is is not high in base camp. It's 17,000 and change respectfully in like mountain world. Um, it's, it's just not that high. So maybe you can do that, but you're also living on a mountain. So people who are affording these types of excursions are not really understanding of what it's like to live and be on a mountain. And I have people message me like, oh, how did you shower? I'm like, that's so cute. You know, yeah. <laughs> so there, there was one actually on base camp, but I went 16 days without showering. Um, you know, you just have to have, the wit and, and the grit to, to handle something like this, but you start slow and you start small and you work your way up and that betters your chances for surviving. And when I say surviving, I mean, coming right. back down alive. Right. Uh, what, what surprised you? Because obviously I know you as someone that prepares, right? Like you, you've always, since I've known you, you've always done your homework. You always come in there and you always over deliver. Uh, you always carry yourself at this level of excellence. And this is coming from someone that, you know, has been watching you for a, a long time. Um, what surprised you throughout this journey, especially because you've, you've, you've climbed th three peaks so far, right? It sounds well, like- Yeah, husband... Peru, Peru isn't one of the seven. So, okay. but this was my second, yeah. This is, this is your, your second. This one seemed like the most difficult, correct? And what, what surprised you on, on this climb? Yeah. I mean, this is the second highest out of the seven. So I won't be going higher until I hit Everest. Um, I think that there's a lot that I learned. Leadership, I would say, was number one, because when I switched into a second group, I stayed into another group. Leadership changed. Um, all of a sudden, these certain guides that were in the first group listened to NIMS when NIMS had to step away and other guides came in that were locals, they all thought that they were in charge and they were all saying different things and it wasn't a cohesive unit. And because of that, that created chaos. That was way before summit day. I started noticing that 
there was a lot of um, negative talk, a lot of questioning things and when we're going to push for summit and what camp we're staying at and all these things kind of happened and it it was a mess and that was the number one thing I would say is leadership you can't prepare for that you come in full trust in this person and this all of these people are getting you up safely and then also returning to safety and the second thing was I would say you know it was a tragedy of of my teammate that um you prepare thinking maybe edema, um, altitude's going to hit you, weather's going to hit you. Like you can't prepare for those things, but you prep, you prepare mentally that some of these things will happen to you. But when there's an emergency and there's not a backup plan and you go, what, what do we do? And everyone's kind of looking around and there was no sense of quick urgency of direction. This is what happens. I would always think that there was like a backup plan and there wasn't one. And so we were learning as we were figuring out a way to get back down. And, uh, you know, then you're living with it even now. Well, what, what happened to you? Well, Cause you brought it up twice already. And, and, and I have an idea of what happened to your teammate, but can you, are you, are you able to talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about it, uh, you know, to the degree of what happened and just respecting his family of where we're at now. Sure. Um, so pretty much, um, very long, very long story short, it's a month on a mountain. Uh, you go through your rotations and that's how you acclimatize to altitude. So you go to camp one, you go back down to base camp, you go to camp two, you go to base camp, you go to three. So you're acclimatizing, you spend some time, maybe you spend the night and then you come back down. And uh, the summit push was a 26 hour push. So um, we were able to stop for a few hours at camp two to just get a meal in and to rest for a couple hours. And then we continued on and we got to about 21, 20, 21,000 and change. I would say probably around like 22,000 and you have a couple hundred feet left and we see the summit. It's right there. And emotion starts to come because you're like, oh my gosh, being on a mountain for a month and going through your rotations again, I'd hypothermia, edema and all these things. And I see it into a second group because of the edema on my face. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. And my team where I was together with a couple of people, we were roped up. We had a guide in front, a guide behind about half of our team was sent down because of uh, potentially getting frostbite of them, you know, having trouble with their breathing and for other reasons that they weren't able to continue on. And then there was a couple of people ahead of us and maybe one or two behind. So our group was separated out based on when we left at different times, um, some people moving a little faster, other reasons. So we're at the top, we see the summit and my teammate, one of them, his name is Rob. He was ahead of us. And his best friend from back home was attached to me on rope. And I heard him scream. And there's no one around. Like, it's just our team at this point because everybody was sent down because the weather was so bad. The only people up there at this moment was our team and guys. We were pushing through. And I looked and I saw my teammate go down the mountain and it was very tragic and um something you can't prepare for something you don't think about and he slipped and fell he knelt to take a to take a rest and what seemed to be a good spot and on his way up he slipped because he was kneeling and the top of his crampons were sitting in so when he came back he fell and I saw his helmet and his goggles and tumbled and it was gut-wrenching and um you know we just pray that he wakes up and that's it I'm sorry I mean obviously you don't want to go there and you know I wasn't you know this obviously isn't about you know telling uh an entertaining story but you know when you when you talk about leadership and you um you know, you speak about this experience and what you went through. I mean, obviously, this is probably one of the most life-changing moments that you might ever have, right? I mean, you'll put this up when, 
you know, I mean, when I saw my kids born and Derek saw his kids born and you go through certain things, I mean, that's top of the list. I mean, this, this is going to be tough to, um, you know, out surpass. I mean, I think the changes you've probably gone through since then has probably been, you know, um, mind boggling, right? I think it's the best word to give it. I mean, how do you feel, you know, this has, where have you pivoted in your life since returning, right? Where has, you know, you, 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 you went there with a thirst and passion for this. Do you regret doing it? Do you feel like, no, this is part of your purpose. This is what you need to be doing. Is this now catapulting you into looking at life a bit differently? For sure. And, um, I definitely came back a different person. I was already going to, this was like at the very, very end, you're on a mountain for a month. Our group got separated. I ended up living at base camp for like four days by myself. I had a guide in a different tent. You eat meals, that's it. So when you're left kind of alone for a couple of days and you have your team ahead of you and waiting for them to come down from their rotation and all these things, you learn so much. And I could go on and on and on about what I learned, but leadership is definitely one of them. Um, and I could dive well into that. The second thing I would say is we live in a world of just such big distractions. There's so many, so much color, so loud, so much noise. Um, and from somebody who's so loud and energy, as you know, that I am, I came back and I was like, I came back into a gym and was like, it's, it's so, it's so loud. There's so much going on. It's like, this is crazy because you just saw people, a couple people and white snow, like there's nothing else going on. And you also have the time to really think about things that you suppress in, in your life for years. And you kind of deal with your stuff that you've just kind of pushed down. It's come to light. And, um, I definitely came back a different person, but mostly it's just the appreciation of people and things that you, that you have, you don't need certain things that you do and wear and have for other people to validate you and who you are. And I'm just very thankful. And I made a lot of big calls when I came back to certain family members and to certain people in my life. And just to make sure, like, you know, that I love and care for you. And, um, we're just very grateful to be here and be happy and alive. Really. So, so where do you go from here? Are you going to continue to pursue um, these different peaks and all that? Because you know, if it were me, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to go ride roller coasters and get an adrenaline rush some other way. Uh, that's probably a little more controlled. How are you dealing with that? Oh yeah, man, let's go. <laughs> we're definitely going. I mean, at the time, instantly you're saying like you're done. Of course, I, I mean, I think everybody does. Um, but it was interesting when I was there before I really acclimatized, I said, there's no way I can go higher. Like this is it. And then it got to a point that I was so acclimatized. I was sleeping at almost 23, 20,000 feet. And I was like, I feel great. I don't have a headache. I feel fine. Like, let's do this thing. And it feels like you're going into a marathon, but not once, but two, three, four times. That's really what it feels like. And I had no idea. Like, I know I'm strong. My legs are strong. My mind is very strong. I have a strong will, but I had no idea to the degree of how strong I was. I mean, I really didn't just go up this thing and do rotations. I essentially climbed this thing up until that camp three, like three, three times. I went up and down so many times. Um, so I know I can do more. And that's what's so crazy is that this is how high you are. This is everything that you've gone through, but I know I can achieve more. So um, next year I'm looking into Mount Vincent, which is in Antarctica. It's not as high, but uh, it's the coldest place on earth. And you have to have a 60 pound pack and pull a 60 pound sled. And uh, I'm training now and I'm, I'm ready to get back out there. Cause I feel like it's, it's uh, I feel unfinished. I feel like I went to the Super Bowl, but like I got, I didn't get you know, the trophy or something. So I, I have to get back out there. Well, obviously it's not, I mean, you, you finished the climb, right? Like it's just because now you're saying to yourself, there's more out there and I have to accomplish more. That's why you're feeling what you're feeling. We got up to, we were short by 400 feet, 400 feet, yeah. which is crazy, but we had to turn around because of what happened 
and yeah. understandably so. Um, but that's that's where I feel like I have I have to go and I need that sense of like I did it selfishly. Um no, I, I it completely happened. Yeah. I it's hard. There's like this very big selfishness, unselfishness that's there, and it's like this mental battle, but um yeah, I'll definitely 100% will keep going. I haven't decided if I'll go back there yet. That's not decided. You know, it, it's fascinating sometimes because, you know, Derek, you'll relate to this with people you've worked with. You know, I love the, the line when, when, you know, I've heard this a thousand times. Oh my God, if I had that person's money, I would never work anymore, right? Like you hear a line like that and you say to yourself, well, there's a reason why you don't have Bill Gates's money or Warren Buffett's money. You look at them continuing to work. It's not obviously massively successful and I'm sure they do love money. But for them, I believe it's something beyond money that pushes them. It's, I don't want to say the, the, the game, but it becomes part of their purpose. And you never really ex expect people to understand, right? Like Derek, why is the sprinter going to go on a track and run the same route, 100 meters, 100 meters for the next you know, 20 years of their, of their life and practice and practice? Or why is someone who's into their physique going to go in and pick up weights and train and beat the living crap out of themselves? And why is someone going to go and climb where, when at the end of the, the day, is there any type of monetary return on it? Well, I believe maybe things will come in the future from it, but for right now, it's not about that from you, right? Nor what I believe with you, is it ever been about that, right? But when you talk about leadership and you think about, you know, when you were discussing the experience with watching leadership change, it's fascinating how, I'm going to say this, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but how important leadership is in all aspects, right? Who's, you know, when you look at leadership on a sport team or a leadership on a climb, or if someone owns a gym, who's the leader, who's the person who is leading their team, this will make him make or break a business. In your case, unfortunately, it could determine life or death. And from learning and seeing leadership, how has this changed you as a leader? Like, how is this now allowed you to approach business differently? And maybe fears that you have, that maybe, you know, we still spoke, speak about or spoke about, we've all had them six months to 12 months ago. Do those suddenly evaporate? And are you looking at things a little bit differently? I, I definitely look at things differently. Um, leadership is leadership. As you said, it doesn't matter what business or approach it is. It's still leadership. Um, I, I believe that everyone has the same common goal and, and purpose. We all want to achieve the same thing. It doesn't matter what position you are in your business or where you're at, but you have to have that trust that this person is guiding you and pulling you in the right direction, not pushing you. And when I came back, I was so lenient with so many things with coaches because I coach coaches and there's empathy is incredibly important. People are very emotional and acknowledging emotions is very important. But at the end of the day, um, this is what we're doing it and explaining why we're doing it. And you got to come, you got to come with me and I need you to kind of put in that effort in, in, in part of that. No one's going to kind of, we can reach down and, and pull you up for sure. But I also need you to meet me there too. How far can I keep reaching and over and over and over again? Um, I, I need that effort from you. And uh, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's consistent. You're going to fail. When you fail, you learn your biggest lessons of life for sure. Um, but you, you got to put in that effort. And what we do now is there's so much excuses for so many things to not achieve and do the things that you want to do. And you can keep pointing the fingers at everybody else. But if you keep doing that, you got to start pointing the finger at yourself and taking some ownership and accountability that you're the common denominator for these things not happening. So I'm a believer of, you know, explaining why we're doing these things, but it's not just, um, you know, do it. But if this person is saying, and this person's saying do this, and this person's saying doing this, I don't know where we're going here and chaos starts to happen. And what about what about the concept of, uh, of teamwork? Because obviously that you need leadership, but at the same time, if you're going to go tackle something like climb one of these mountains, you don't want any weak people on your team either. And so, how do you make sure that you've 
and maybe weeding them out is a, a tough term, but I know Don has had to build teamwork uh, with his employees and there may be weak people that are disrupting his ability to run the business. And I know the same with staff that I've been involved with or leading, but how do you make sure that you have the right people around you? Yeah. Um, hire slow, let go fast. Teamwork is definitely really important that everybody has a say and a voice. That's the power of, of a team. Um, but to make sure that we have the same goals and objectives and we stick to those core values so that that's what we do. And if you're not following your business's core values, you can be the best coach doing the most amount of sessions, doing all these things, but you're disrespectful for your team. I don't care as an organization, those sessions, whatever it is, it's going to come down. And if you're not made to be on that team, everybody, your team is so strong that if there's that, I don't, not weak, but a person that's not fit for that team, they'll wean themselves out. They're going to start to feel uncomfortable to be around this team because this is so ultra positive and doing so well. And there's this person here. It's like, ah, oh, they complain. They give the excuses. Like this team is going to start to kind of do this a little bit. And they're going to start to feel this a little bit because they're not being the energy vampire, they're going to start to separate and having those conversations of, Hey, like I'm going to be as unbiased as possible. Maybe they've never had a strong person in their life, a mentor, a coach that's really reached out and said, Hey, like you haven't been in this environment before, but I'm going to really pull you in. And I'm going to do everything in my power to pull you in on this side of the fence. But if you keep over and over resisting and not making mistakes, but you're a mistake repeater. You know, how much time are you spending with this person that it's just not working? And that's really the big question because they could be a mother or father and they have kids and roles and responsibilities. And like, I don't want to lose this person, but I'm spending so much time here that that's pulling away from these other people. I don't know if that's really fair. Funny, you start talking about teammates, right? And and I think a lot of business owners that I've been around, including myself, I'm I'm, I'm guilty of it in the past. Um, people are guilty of it too, just in relationships and life and who we surround ourselves with. We have a tendency to settle for something that feels a bit comfortable, right? Yeah. It's not necessarily elevating us. It's not bettering us but we're comfortable. I mean, an example I'm going to give, and I, I hope a lot of people are going to relate to this, but I had an employee working for me, a coach years ago, and he was, he did a good job. He was, a word I used was fine. He was fine. He was got a, a, a good build on him. He, um, you know, would come in, programming was decent, but he didn't have this energy that, you know, I felt was infectious and that I look for in a coach. He didn't really demand much out of the people around him. And he kind of just kind of crawled, but he got it done. And um, at, at a certain point, I, you know, I had a part ways with this individual and I passed his sessions off, which was only a few mm -hmm. to my other coaches and my other coaches who had higher levels of, of leadership and energy. They took the one session that this person was doing and they turned it into three or this one took the two uh, sessions that he was doing and turned it into four. And it really opened my eyes to something. It opened my eyes to the fact that I was shooting myself in the foot and I was settling for someone in my world, in my business, in my life, that wasn't performing at a level that I was hoping they would perform at. And you know what? Maybe they weren't passionate about their job. Maybe this wasn't their long-term plan. Maybe this isn't what they wanted to do. Um, and I, in the beginning, I almost blamed him for it. And after a while, I blamed myself because as a leader, I had to do a better job of recognizing that. And I had to do a better job of saying, if you're not giving me what I need in my business for not only myself to be successful, it's not only about, you know, my success, it's more about the people around me, it's the people around me, the clients, right? The trainers, the staff, if they're successful and they have a a bit, um, more of a feeling of, of, of um, you know, of you know, this level of success, this level of empowerment. I, I think the whole business, the whole team, the whole unit thrives. And this is what you're talking about, right? You're only as strong as your weakest link. 
you have one person in that equation that is lowering their standard, lowering their bar a little bit, this acts as an anchor. This is pulling everyone else down. I mean, very rarely is that going to push everyone else. I mean, it, it really is. It really is a very powerful comment that you that you pass. It is, and what you said is so right because you attract like attracts like, and you think that that's kind of just being off to the side, but that that will be your anchor, and then everything else that happens will start to be okay or fine too. You know, the dumbbells aren't really lined up before that they used to be. There's a little piece of paper on the floor. People then tend to just walk by it because we saw Bob walk right by it. So everything will start to not continue to evolve and grow. It will start to be that anchor point. So you have to have the team that's gonna continue to push the barrier, think, evolve and grow. That's why I love mountain climbing and mountain. Yes, is a mountain, but it's the analogy in life. You know, it could be anything. It could be your weight loss journey. It could be your business. It could be relationships. Sometimes it's really steep. Sometimes it goes down pretty quick. Sometimes you're coasting, but you have to be around like-minded people that are going to continue to push and grow. And that's why when I first met you, I said, oh my gosh, I need to be around Dawn as much as humanly possible because you have that energy, that aura, but it transfers throughout your whole life. It's you as a person, yourself, your family, your business, everything. So you have to be around those people. Thank you. Dave? Yeah, Yes, so there's obviously a lot of kind of ecotourism and people wanting to pay their way to get to the top of a mountain. What, what advice do you have for people who are considering that? Uh, either encouragement or discouragement. Um, what would you say to these people if they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, train. I, I hear it all the time. Like, oh, I've got six months. I'm going to train for an Ironman triathlon. It's like, uh, oh, good luck. But, but how do you, you know, give them that reality check and, and point them in the right direction? Yeah. You got to dive really deep and find that why, like, why do you want to do the Ironman? Why do you want to climb this mountain? Why do you want to do this? And we as coaches say this all the time, but you got to get down nitty gritty, like nitty gritty, real purpose. Oh, I want to lose 10 pounds. Why? When you're 10 pounds later, why, what do you feel? And then all of a sudden it comes down to, I'm very uncomfortable around my significant other. There it is. You know, so sure. you really have to find that real big purpose of why, so that when those difficulty things come up where this is the hardest training session and everything goes against you and you hurt your knee, are you going to, you know, quit or you're going to keep going? That why is so strong that that will always surmount any of the things that come in your way. And you're going to have, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad day. It might just be a bad five minutes, but you think it's a bad day and it's your willingness to be consistent. You can coach an amazing session. You can have an amazing class. You can have an amazing meal, but what's being a professional is doing it over and over and over again and delivering that same standard every single time. What about, I mean, this may sound like a weird question, but did you find that one month that you were away climbing in a way, you know, fighting for your life at times, did you find that the most present you've ever been in your life? Like, did you, did your mind wander? Were you at times thinking about work, thinking about family, or were you, or, or did you feel as locked in as you've ever felt locked in? Locked in completely. Um, you, it's so difficult what you're doing. You're literally down so focused that you're thinking step by step but you even prepare so much to where your snack is located in your summit suit so that that is the only thing that you can think about. When you get back down to base camp where you're resting for a day or two, that's when you can kind of think about, oh, what about this and what about that? You're actually extremely clear because again, all those distractions are taken out of it, but you are the most present I've ever been. Yeah, but that's that's why I was asking this. And this is what I find is fascinating, Derek. Um, you know, I, I've been I've been interviewing a lot of people in reference to mindset, and I've been I have mentors and I have people that show a high level of success. And I really feel like these things that we're talking about, whether it's business, whether it's your health and wellness, granted, there's things with your health that are just, you know. The, the, the wrong end of the coin pops up and it's out of your power, right? We see this happen every single day, but 
I think having the ability to be present, especially in your fitness and wellness, is something that most people aren't necessarily focused on. And the reason why I'm coming to this right now is I always like coming back to this because this is where people struggle. I need to lose 15 pounds. I need to lose 20 pounds. I'm obsessing over being in distress and what you're saying right now, or the suit, or look at being at this event. And I'm like, focus on today. If you like every day you woke up and you had a task, I would imagine. Every day you woke up, you had a responsibility to yourself and the people around you. Every day you woke up and your and your focus was very granular. It wasn't like, oh, we've got three more weeks and I, I can't wait. No, you were like, I need to do this. And that's where I think people fall short in life is they start getting so ahead of themselves or they start living so much in the past that they can't focus on the tar on that target. And you know, I, I was talking to a business person, he's a billionaire, and he's become massively, massively successful. Very well-known name, one of the most well-known names. And um, he is so successful in business and not successful with his fitness and health. And when you look at how he approached both of them, and I've told the story before, one's here with preparation and contacting the best people around that can handle X, Y, and Z, which he can't handle and all these things. And then on this, in this other aspect, he's looking up YouTube videos and just pulling out workouts and just doing them. I'm like, oh my, I looked at him. I said, could you imagine treating your business like this? Imagine <laughs> waking up today and saying, what are we going to do? What are we going to focus on? We're not going to prepare. I'm just going to, oh, I'm hungry. Where do I eat? Like you didn't do, you never did that a moment in your life in business. So why are you treating this area that much differently? And when we talk about Derek, someone preparing for the Olympics, or Derek's a world-renowned running mechanics coach, everyone knows him. It's like when he works with athletes and they're, they're focused on that moment, or you're climbing with the best climber in the world, and you are probably so dialed in that moment, or if you're preparing for someone, uh, preparing someone for a task, and they are focused on that task, and they're excellent at it, I, I wish the majority of the world would look back and would realize that you're just making, you're just approaching this in a way that's in my eyes, incorrect. And that's why you haven't been successful. You ever hear the quote of it's never about the destination. It's about the journey. Yeah. Of yeah. course. And I started going into it, going just through a rotation going, Oh my God, how am I going to make it? And they said, if you go into that, you're screwed. You're just screwed. Your mindset is way over here. You're not present. You have to accomplish this and then and acknowledge that I just did this. So your focus on that race or your focus on that job, it is step by step by step. It is granular. And then you change your mindset because you just achieved this little bit. You just achieved, I want to lose 15. What if you, you posted a video two days about it? What if you lost eight? But your yeah. body composition just changed. Oh, that's going to change everything. But you're so embedded in this number. Forget it. Yeah, no, it's it's the worst, Steve. Yeah, and I'm always still struggling with this um, this idea of overcoming fear. But at the same time, do you increase the risk whenever you do that? And what's the balance point for you? Like, I, I keep looking back at the these guys who went down to visit the Titanic in a plastic tube, and I'm like, okay. Okay, you know, obviously there's a science component and there's a calculation there. And then there's the, hey, this is a great journey to go see something that only a few people have seen. But where do you draw the line in terms of that risk to benefit ratio? Yeah, everything worth having is, is an easy, right? It's the hard that makes it great. And everything you want is on the other side of fear. So I think there's the level of fear for you and you have to know that things happen with that risk. There could be that failure, but that failure is where you learn the most. What if you just won and achieved everything? It's like, you don't learn from that. You're just always great, but you have to, you have to fail. You must fail. And that will catapult you into the next greatest thing. And it's okay. Um, for me, that fear, that seems something so close yet so out of reach i think the fear for me is is the death and i know what it feels like to get close to it and i know when to pull back so 
that's an extreme level, but in anything else that you want to achieve, you have to go into it going, this could not work. Am I okay with it not working? I don't, I, I don't know. I was, I mean, now that you, you're returned and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a period of time you're probably still going through it where, you know, you're kind of assessing what just happened. What did you go through? I'm sure there was this, you know, period of uh, reflection, right? Um, what's changed for you now? Like, wh where do you see your life and your business? Like, was there any moments where when you got back, you're like, all right, you know what? Fuck this. This is, I'm doing this or, or, or I'm cutting this. Like, is there anything you can talk about or is it just this over, you know, uh, this overall umbrella of, you know, gratitude and, you know, not taking things for granted. Like, where are you at with it? I think that all the things you mentioned, but the biggest thing is the quality over quantity. And that's in all areas of my life. Is it people? Is it things that I'm trying to achieve in business? I want to do all these things. Um, relationships, the people that are in my life, business, every aspect of my life. It is now zoned in of I'm putting the effort and energy into these things. And I'm going to make this so amazingly great. And just because I can't have this person in my life or have this part of the business in my life right now, it doesn't mean that it's bad or I have to just cut ties. It's this is no longer serving the purpose. And there is a little bit of that selfishness of I just am not able to do this right now um, because anything could happen. And I just didn't give that effort and time into these people and these things. So it's putting the effort of the time and the quality into people and areas of my life. You, um, when are you, when are you up in New York? I'm just curious. I'm hoping next month. Okay, we have to connect for that. And we have to, you know, we have to get together and maybe, maybe take a trip out to the barn and come, come into the barn. <laughs> You know me, I'm, I'm always here. Where um can you let everyone know where can they um where can they find you, you know, contact you if they you know if they're interested in anything from a fitness standpoint or if they're down in Miami. I mean, Jacqueline's my my main recommendation down there. If there's a coach you want to work with in the Miami area, I mean she's the one I would go see. So um, can you give us your information a little bit? Sure, appreciate it. So you can find me anywhere at Case and Fitness. It's K A S E N Fitness. That's via Gmail. That's Instagram. Shoot me a DM. I answer every single person that messages me. Um, but I'm changing things on the website and building, and it's going to be amazing. So there's there's a lot of things that are going to now catapult, and the mountain is going to be used as an analogy for a lot of things. So just reach out, and I will answer anything health, wellness, support, and comfort. I'm there to help everybody. That's the passion. 100 percent. I know um, you and I got some talk. We we got some things to to discuss. Uh, Derek, that was pretty awesome, right? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, always when we we learn from people that we interview, and makes me reevaluate. You know, my whole risk to reward threshold and and should I be getting out there doing new things? So yes. Thank you. Yes, you can. I think it's important too. It is a friend of mine said something the other day. He goes, you know, and it was an interesting way of putting it, it was I try and do something every day to get myself a little bit uncomfortable. Now you got yourself very uncomfortable. Like that's that's an extreme, but I, I do think people need to start and get themselves a little bit uncomfortable every day because I, you know, I do believe, you know, one word that I've always hated is complacency. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> to give me a line he's, he's moved on now and uh you know run scared try harder and there's no room for complacency it was always something that i loved i admired at, at a young age and i've tried to follow and believe in and sometimes we get a little comfortable with just getting on the couch and sitting there and throwing a tv show on it becomes very comfortable and the next thing you know years go by and health goes south and you know we can't take this thing this, this for granted we can't take this gift of life for granted. We we have to live it to our fullest. So Jacqueline, you're you're doing it. Glad to call your friend, little sister of mine over here. I love you to death. Love um, you too. Let's let's get on the text and thanks for your time and, and let's go. Perfect. On. All right. Thank you so much for having me. And it was so nice to meet you. This is so great. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. you too. Bye.